Good evening, everyone. My name is Bob Monk, and I'm the Interim Chief Operating Officer of the Peabody Essex Museum. I bid you all a very warm welcome to our program, and thank you for sharing your time with us on this beautiful New England spring late afternoon. As I'm sure you're all aware, PEM and its predecessor organization, the Essex Institute, have assembled one of the largest and most varied collection of early American architecture not to mention the finest example of a late 18th century Chinese merchant's house in America today. It has really been my honor and privilege over the past 22 years to play a small role in the care and preservation of these important structures. And I don't believe that it's an overstatement or hubris to say that thanks to the support and inspiration of PEMS Board of Trustees, advisors, donors, and many of you attending this program today, that PEMS historic buildings have never structurally been in better shape than they are currently. The important question is, what's next for this amazing collection? Our panelists tonight will focus on what I believe is one of the greatest needs of historic structures that exist in museum and tour tourism-based settings today. And that is identifying the means and methods by which uh, they can be best uh, activated and revitalized. So on behalf of all of us at PEM, I want to thank our panelists, as well as our colleagues at the Cape Ann Museum for their participation this evening. So without further delay, I'd like to introduce Oliver Barker, director of the Cape Ann Museum. Oliver, welcome, and I turn the virtual microphone over to you. Thank you, Bob. Thank you for that generous introduction. Um, and as director of the Cape Ann Museum, I'm delighted to be joining um, you all here tonight. It's immense privilege. Um, I will just add that despite the lingering pandemic, I'm happy to report that the Cape Ann Museum is energetically forging ahead with exciting plans this year. And we have entered the year with great gusto and momentum. Today marks an exciting moment to be gathering in partnership with PEM. And I did want to take this moment to thank Bob Monk, Amanda Clark McMullen, Blair Steck, and our three panelists tonight for making this conversation possible. For those of you who are new to the Cape Ann Museum, we were founded in 1875 and represent the unique place of Cape Ann as one of the most important places in the history of American art and industry. As such, the Cape Ann Museum celebrates this history and the remarkable, remarkable contributions of this place to the cultural enhancement of our community and to the world at large, yesterday, today, and tomorrow. During the pandemic, the museum um, has been focused on broadening our community reach and concurrently completed the creation of a new campus, the Cape Ann Museum Green, including the construction of a new 12,000 square foot uh, building uh, named the Janet and William Ellery James Center. Positioned at the gateway to anyone arriving in Gloucester, this new campus and the three historic structures that CAM owns, um, and that will be the subject of Martha Oakes's presentation tonight, provide a new and important welcome to everyone here on Cape Ann. The museum opened last fall, uh, reopened last fall, and in returning to regular operating hours next month, I wanted to invite everyone here tonight to join us at our main campus on Pleasant Street, where there are new and rotating displays now on view, including the refurbished exhibit featuring the work of Fitz Henry Lane and new displays in our maritime and fisheries galleries. Starting on June 18th at the new Cape Ann Museum Green, please also visit and experience the new campus with us and the inaugural exhibition for this summer season celebrating the Great Marsh that will be featuring the work of Essex sculptor Brad Storey and the Ipswich photographer Dorothy Kerper Manelli. Turning to today's conversation, history represents the past, the present, and the future. And at the Cape Ann Museum, we are interested in stories both told and untold. Today's joint CAM PEM forum is an exciting way in which we can begin to explore these important histories together and is part of an ongoing commitment by the Cape Ann Museum to further research the people and the places they have called home here on Cape Ann. In the coming months, CAM looks forward to digging deeper into this complex and nuanced history, focusing on many first period structures 
including those owned by the Cape Ann Museum, the White Ellery House built in 1710, the Babson Ailing House built around 1740, and the Elias Davis House, which was built between 1799 and 1804. Tonight's conversation is a wonderful step in exploring these stories further. And with that, it is my great pleasure to turn this conversation over to our panelists, Stephen Malloroy at PEM and Martha Oakes from the Cape Ann Museum. Stephen and, Mal Stephen and Martha, over to you. Would you like me to go first, Stephen? Sure, okay, you're there now. <laughs> okay. Absolutely. Um, it's, it's a pleasure to um, join in this conversation this afternoon and thank you to everybody who's um, come inside to do so. Um, I've been asked just to introduce myself. Um, I'm the curator of the Cape Ann Museum and um, being curator of this museum means that I wear many, many different hats and sometimes it's a challenge, but more often it's very exciting. My responsibilities range from researching and organizing exhibitions to overseeing the permanent collection, working with outside professional conservators and scholars, training docents, in essence, a little bit of everything. Um, among my many responsibilities um, are watching over our um, historic structures. This includes working with preservation consultants and tradespeople, um, setting priorities for work on, uh, to be done on the structures, and along with my colleagues uh, for devising methods uh, to make each site accessible and um, engaging for the public. Stephen, do you want to say a few words about yourself? Thank you, Martha. Uh, yes, I'm the manager of historic uh, structures and landscapes for the PVD Essex Museum. And um, I've had the privilege of being along the ride with PEM for about eight or nine years now uh, before coming on staff uh, about almost three years ago. I was a consultant working with them on historic structures reports for their historic buildings with the long game of what we've continually been working on, which is um, addressing structural and conditions issues and getting them ready for a much bigger platform in the museum's uh, public programming. And so uh, lots of what I do uh, it has been getting the buildings into tip top shape so they look fabulous from the outside. And um, I should mention that our, um, our historic buildings comprise 23 structures. Uh, five of them are open regularly uh, in normal times. Uh, it was four, but now with the Pickman House and a partnership with the city that we'll talk about a little bit later, it's five. Um, one is available for um, events, uh, rentals and, and programming, uh, others for special occasions and also um, for study. And we're striving to get more and more of these buildings uh, open and available to the public and the public aware of what they are. And a big piece of that during COVID when people could not tour the buildings has been a real push to get a digital presence, an online presence established for them so that people from anywhere from the neighborhood to all over the world might be able to experience a piece of them uh, in times when they can't um, actually access them. So it's kind of an exciting time for not just historic structures at PEM and CAM, but really all over the country. Okay, so I'll start out with my slides. I have about 10 of them. Oh, no, Stephen, I guess you're starting off. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so is this my, this is my first slide. It looked like they were not in order. It doesn't matter. I'll just, I'll go with whatever comes up. I'm, I'm totally fine. <laughs> PBD Essex, the core of PBD Essex's historic structures are really integrated within the greater campus that we call the Essex block. And that's the main museum, a main thoroughfare and pedestrian mall in the heart of Salem, museum office and meeting space, and this collection of historic structures, which also incorporates historic landscapes and, and a lot of outdoor space that we are increasingly uh, utilizing. And so um, some of the buildings have been moved to their previous locations. Um, PEM really started out in as far as back as 1859 as kind of a pioneer in uh, rescuing important historic structures. And in some cases, they were able to stay in their original locations. And in, I think, three examples, they were not. Um, 
And really every decade throughout the 20th century, except for one, the 1930s, PEM acquired another building and added it to its collection. Uh, the core of them, like I said, are in downtown Salem. And then we have three other structures that are remote, um, that are on the other side of, they're an easy walk from the campus. And uh, that's the Ropes Mansion and Gardens and the Assembly House and the um, Purse Nichols House. Um, I think next, this, this slide, yeah. One thing that PEM and CAM really have in common that it's really interesting is that we both have historic structures that have been creatively subsumed into museum modern gallery space. So you can transition from a gallery or an interpretive area uh, or museum open space inside right into an historic house experience. This is our Yin Yutong house, which was completed in 2003. It came out, it's a merchant's mansion like Bob Monk uh, mentioned earlier from uh, China from the 1780s and is a part of our expansion and exploration of um, the, the golden age of the China trade in Salem. This building was brought over and reassembled and, uh, and it is a part of the actual museum gallery experience. It's not a historic structure kind of in its own right that, that is elsewhere that you walk up to. Uh, next slide, please. As a part of that experience, uh, visitors can enjoy an interpretive gallery in the main museum that can uh, that augments the uh, Yin Yutong House and, and more opportunities to learn about the China trade. And from this particular gallery, um, uh, it's a great complement of a, of a modern kind of artistic setting to um, uh, the Yin Yutong House. And here is the Ropes Mansion, which is um, a 1729 house that really is more of a colonial revival experience because of its uh, restoration by family members in the late 19th century and then the development of this important um, architectural uh, colonial revival garden in the back in 1912. And here, uh, the visitor it can experience a self-guided tour of the gardens. They're open to the public every day, dawn to dusk. They're enjoyed uh, immensely. Uh, the public more recently has been able to be involved with the actual planting and, and maintenance of the garden. Um, and then as far as a tour of the interior of the house, it was the restoration of it was, I believe, uh, completed in 2014 or 15. And uh, next slide, please. Uh, in, in the, in the uh, Ropes Mansion, you can uh, experience a, a, a very razor sharp restoration, uh, forensic restoration of the interior on the first floor, where you see the building the way that the Ropes sisters uh, left it in uh, at the end of the 19th century with all of its original furnishings, um, and you can see wallpapers and carpetings uh, and things like that that are all uh, correct. But And this is a self-guided tour. And then on the second floor, um, additional ropes family uh, decorative arts and other objects are presented in a, uh, a gallery type of setting. So you're not going from the first to the second floor seeing um, really all of a period house. Here you get the landscape outside, you get the experience of the restored interior on the first floor and part of the second, and then you get a gallery space that's a, 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 a really a, a, a presentation of the family's you know, 200 years of uh, uh, decorative arts, not really collecting, but more like family pieces and things like that. Uh, next slide, please. So also like, uh, like Cape Ann Museum, we have a first period structure. This one is the John Ward House, and it was restored uh, in 1910 to uh, the, the prevailing colonial revival tastes of the time. And um, I know that uh, Cam's um, White Ellery House is kind of a forensic experience that's used for other things uh, on occasion as well, where you see an unrestored interior and learn about building history. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, inside the John Ward House, what we're really trying to do is utilize a colonial revival 
experience or, or restoration to give uh, a 17th, uh, the visitors the impression of what life in a 17th century house uh, was like. And this is on a regular number of tours that are uh, guided by the museum, one of which is the shelter to showpiece tour, which involves this house. And um, the house is brimming with potential for uh, two major studies were done in, in past years that did a couple of dissections and uh, uh, rounds of dissections and things like that to really learn what the house was. And it turns out that there's just a watershed of evidence left in it that uh, would give it uh, uh, the opportunity for a, a restoration that would give a, a more enhanced 17th century experience. And so that's something to, to uh, really be thinking about. And I'm very cognizant of time. So next slide. And then finally, the, that last house I'd like to talk to you about is our Crown and Shield Bentley house. And this is a Georgian era house from 1729 that was uh, built by the Crown and Shield family of merchants and, and lived in for many decades. It's, most, uh, it's kind of most noteworthy uh, historical information is that it was uh, lived in from 1794 until 1819 by the epic diarist and local minister, the Reverend William Bentley. And he recorded hundreds and hundreds of pages of town activity and local politics and houses being built and the weather. And these are such incredibly important diaries that even today they're studied by even climate change experts who are looking for data dating back to other centuries. Now this house is, is period interpreted on the interior to the time of the Reverend William Bentley, which was like I said, 1794 to 1819. Um, however, it's also really important to uh, part of the research that we did on this building a number of years ago, if I could have the next slide, is that on the third floor, um, we have a very, very important room and a really golden opportunity for the museum and the community and, and everyone in that um, the 1775 um, probate inventory of Anstis Crown and Shield, the widow of John, who dies in that year, lists a family of free slaves who were living in the house at that time. And by process of extensive research and uh, uh, dower rights and, and family members inheriting halves of houses and access to rooms, we've really pinpointed that this was the room that that family would have lived in and they were um, emancipated in 1783, but were not because of estate and estate settling reasons. They were not actually, they didn't actually, were not able to leave the premises until 1788, I believe. But this is the room that they, that they lived in uh, more likely than not. And it's also, this house is, an, this is another reason that it, it is such an important uh, sister building to the, um, Babs and Alling House that uh, Martha is going to be talking to you about. And next slide. My last slide is the Gardner Pingree House, and this is an epic federal period mansion designed uh, by John uh, by Samuel McIntyre, and the, we our collection retains the original drawings. He also was responsible for coordinating with John uh, Gardner to have the right furniture. Uh, made and the right wall coverings and carpetings. And this is a really early example of what we call the coordinated interior where an architect like McIntyre actually worked with the client, not just to construct the house that they wanted to, to but to create an entire residential experience on kind of a holistic uh, level. Now, uh, we'll be talking about this a little bit more with Ken uh, later in, our, in, in, in this program, but Currently, the tour of this house involves the architecture. It involves John Gardner as a participant in the global um, maritime trade that uh, made Salem very rich in the uh, early 19th century. Um, but what we really are focusing, you know, I think that we're, we're all realizing that, that the stories of the houses are what really matter and that people like to relate to or hear about the, the things that actually happened in these houses. And 
uh, we know that this house, people experienced elegant winter balls during that season and the rooms were designed for entertaining and that sort of thing. But really the, the, out, the kind of outstanding uh, human interest story in this house is um, the story of Joseph White's murder, which happened in 1830 and was an epic sensation. Um, it was really the murder of the 19th century or the story of the 19th century until the Lizzie Borden murder. And um, it was tried and prosecuted by none other than Daniel Webster. And uh, many historians believe that it was the inspiration for uh, Edgar Allan Poe's The Telltale Heart. And I believe, okay, I wanna save that slide until later on in our discussion, if you don't mind. And I'd like to just pass things on to Martha. Thank you, Stephen. That was wonderful. So I'll take my first slide. <clears throat> um, currently, the uh, Cape Bay Museum, which, as Oliver said, was founded in um, eight, 1875, uh, maintains four historic structures. Um, the Captain Elias, da Elias Davis House, which is shown in the upper right on the screen, was built between 1799 and 1804. And it's part of our headquarters in downtown Gloucester. Um, and then the other three properties are outliers. They're located at the Cape Ann Museum Green, which is just off Route 128 when you come into Gloucester. And uh, those buildings include on the upper left, the White Ellery House, the first, peri first period house built in 1710. And right below that is an image of the Babson Alling House, which dates to around 1740. And then on the lower right, you see a, a four bay barn, which also dates to about 1740 and historically um, was part of the Babson property. Um, go on to the next slide, please. Um, while the Cape Bay Museum has focused intently on its historic structures in recent years, it's important to point out that the museum has always had a strong interest in historic buildings. Uh, the, uh, this slide lists the various properties that we've owned over the decades and includes the years that we owned of ownership. As you can see for a brief time in the mid 1950s where the little circle is on the chart, we were responsible for five structures located at four different places around Cape Ann. The Davis House and the Ellery House and the barn, which we, all, which we still own. Um, and then two additional properties, 90 Middle Street, which is the yellow gambrel roofed house on the left-hand side of the screen. And we also owned the Haskell Atkins house, which is in West Gloucester and on the right-hand side of the screen. Um, and for what in the 1950s was an almost entirely volunteer driven organization, it must've been an extraordinary amount of time to take care of these buildings, not to mention driving all over Gloucester to get from one to the other. Um, and it must have been a lot of work because the museum let the Haskell Atkins house go in 1959, just four years after it was purchased. And 90 Middle Street, the yellow house, um, which the museum used as rental space, uh, was held only until 2000. And then if you look at the chart on the very bottom on the right hand corner, you see um, the acquisition of the Babson Alling house, which uh, just happened in the spring of 2000 and 19. So all of a sudden we're back up to for historic structures. And we can go on to the next slide. Um, and these slides sort of go a little bit into depth about each of the properties. Um, and the museum purchased the Davis House in 1923, and it was really our first permanent home. And it's shown in a, a wonderful little historic image on the lower right there taken in 1926. Um, and at that time, the museum was largely a lecture society and uh, walls were opened up on the first floor so that lectures could be held and displays were held on the upper floors. And the house filled up very, very quickly. And as best we can tell, almost all the art and artifacts uh, related to the old Yankee history of Cape Ann, um, about the very earliest English settlers and what their life was like here. And within a decade, uh, the museum had outgrown the space. Um, and a modern wing was put on the back. And at that point, the rooms in the Davis house were turned into uh, traditional period rooms, um, reflecting what life might've been like in a home like this during the federal period. And over the years, we've done a lot of work on the house based on 
research that we've done, um, including uh, installation of historic wall coverings, you can see in that right hand upper picture, and also carpeting, and um, done work with probate materials to try and determine what was in each of the rooms. And the Davis House since the 1930s has always been shown by a traditional old fashioned guided tour, which appeals to some people, but doesn't appeal to a other people. Um, but that's sort of how we share it with the, the public now. And we can go on to the next slide. Um, since 1923, the focus of the Davis House tours have been on Elias Davis. And you can see a portrait of him here on the lower left and his involvement in foreign trade and as a privateer during the War of 1812. Um, and as I just mentioned, access to his probate materials has given us an idea of what he owned, what he and his wife owned, and what the rooms in the house were used for. Um, and a couple of years ago, um, a cache of log books kept by Elias Davis were uncovered at Harvard's Houghton Library. They'd been given to Houghton um, just during the Civil War before we existed. And the books show us the trade routes that Davis was engaged in during the 1790s and up through the early 1800s. And many of the books are now digitized and some of our volunteers have been transcribing them and mapping out the trade routes. And what that shows, what the books show us is that Davis was actively involved in the triangular trade, which ultimately brought enslaved people to this country, often via the Caribbean. And this is information that was never passed down to us through the museum records. It's something that we never talked about in our tours uh, in any way. And so as we continue to go through those log books, um, we look forward to incorporating that information into our tours, retraining our guides who show the rooms, um, and expanding the information we share about uh, with visitors about New Englanders' involvement uh, in slavery. Um, we can go on to the next slide, which shows the White Ellery House, which the museum acquired in 1947. And dendrochological testing dates this structure to 1710. Um, and the immediate reason we acquired the house was because of the construction of Route 128, which as it was laid out was going to go straight through this wonderful old house. Um, the building was taken in 1947 by the city of Gloucester by eminent domain and given to the museum with the understanding that we would move it immediately out of the way of the highway. Uh, and the slide on the left is one of the earliest pictures we have of the exterior of the house, probably taken in the 1780s while it was in its original location. And you can see it's got a tall foundation there. It sits right on the edge of the marsh and probably had wet feet at times. And after we acquired it, the house was moved about 100 yards out of the path of the highway and uh, reoriented to face west and set down on a new foundation. Um, you can see in the upper right-hand photo, a uh, historic image of how the house was interpreted and shared with visitors during the 1950s and 60s. Um, I'm not sure if it was by tour, but it was open in the summertime and it was furnished with early American antiques and decorative arts. And the focus was on the early families who had lived in the house. For some years, the house was a tavern, so there was discussion of that. It was also a parsonage. So lots of the early stories um, of the English settlers who lived in the house. And then in the 1970s, um, the museum had a new wing put on and our focus changed and the windows on the poor old Ellery house were boarded up and it was left from 1970s through 2006. Um, and it was not the most welcoming sight when you came into Gloucester, but it was, the roof was sound and the windows were boarded over. So nothing much of detriment happened to it. And in 2007, the museum, the museum decided to take a second look at the property and see how it might help the organization advance its mission. And as you can see from the image on the lower right, uh, we're finally coming to the end of an extensive stabilization of the exterior of the property, um, which included roof work, clapboards, windows, doors, a little bit of everything. So we can go right on to the next slide. Um, to, um, as I mentioned before, the house was owned for over 200 years by uh, one family, the extended Ellery family, and over the generations, their lives touched virtually all aspects of social and economic history here in Gloucester and Cape Ann. And today we share bits of that information in a very traditional sort of text panels with images laid into them hanging on the walls inside the house for the visitor to take in. Um, 
but more importantly, in a way, for the last 10 years, our focus has been on using the house as a backdrop for contemporary art installations, in, uh, installations that take place inside and outside the house. Uh, and the installations have attracted literally hundreds of visitors each summer. Some come to see the art, some come to see the house, and some just come out of pure curiosity about a building that for so long you couldn't even peek in the windows of. Um, this image shows on the left an installation that spilled out into the front yard, um, exploring the plight of the local fishing industry. This was done by an artist named Tim Sauter a few years ago. And then on the right, there's a piece of Essex sculptor Chris Williams's uh, work displayed in the parlor on the first floor. And of course, school children love the sort of exploration component of um, being inside a house that's not furnished, uh, that hasn't been restored, that's really an archaeological artifact, um, and talking about history and how it affects their lives. Um, we can go on to the next slide. In the spring of 2019, uh, the KPM Museum was gifted the Babson Alling House, which you see in these two slides. It sits adjacent to the White Ellery House, and uh, our four bay barn sits between the two houses. Uh, the Babson Alling House was built around 1740. It sits on its original foundation and contains some pretty remarkable paneling and architectural detailing inside. The house was a private home from around 1740 until the museum acquired it. And it has the potential to tell the stories of numerous families who've made contributions um, over the generations to this area. Uh, we're still researching the history of the house, but we've found that there's a range of topics associated with it, and it's a, a, a large span of topics. They go from slaveholders to abolitionists, from ship owners and captains to gentlemen farmers, from women who raised a house full of children to single women who spent much of their time researching the history of their families. So it runs the entire gamut, and it gives us a lot of food for thought. And we can go to the next slide. Um, last year, we began stabilizing the Babson Alling House, working from a conditions report done by architect Wendy Frontiero. And under her guidance, we've made um, a lot of repairs to the building, including the central chimney. And you can see the damage in the right-hand slide to the foundation of that chimney. And that work has been completed. We've put a beautiful new shingle roof on the structure. And we've also begun doing some interior work. And the slide on the upper left shows um, repairs being done to the central staircase, which was quite fragile. And we look forward to continuing this work this coming year and next year, including um, stabilizing a privy, which stands right in the front yard, right alongside Route 128. Um, as stabilize, stabilization work moves ahead, uh, my colleagues and I are exploring options of how to interpret the Babson Alling House and how to share it with visitors. Like most old houses, there um, are a lot of challenges associated with this one, including steep staircases, poor lighting, architectural details that have been compromised over the years. Um, but um, as we'll learn from Ken, there's lots of really creative ways to tackle these challenges and um, interpret a site that, that really engages people um, in different and exciting ways. And let me just go on to my final couple of slides here. I guess this is my last slide. This is the little four bay barn that sits between the White Ellery House and the Babson House at the KPM Museum Green. And it was also built around 1740. And it originally went with the Babson Alling House rather than the White Ellery House. Uh, and it was used to store firewood and hay, and perhaps some small animals, and it became the museums in the 1950s. Uh, it's amazing to me that, and probably to everybody, that given how close it sits to Route 128, that the barn has survived and that it sits on its original foundation. And it's been a multi-year project to stabilize the exterior of the structure. And we did this through the early work of preservationist Bill Finch, who was very involved in leading us uh, through the restoration. And many hands went into um, stabilization of the building, including um, those of preservation students at the North Bennett Street School, who spent some time helping us with um, stabilizing the frame of the building. The barn has a dirt floor and it has no lighting. And the access between the, the four levels is either by one steep staircase or ladders. So we currently don't let visitors inside, although they're welcome to have a peek in, and uh, sort of see the framing um, as much as they can see. 
Um, and recently we begin to, now that the stabilization work is done, um, to explore ways that we might sort of activate the property. And um, early on during the pandemic, um, we had a light projection installation that you can see the lower right-hand photo that um, was acknowledging the work of frontline workers during the pandemic. Um, and this is something that we'll experiment with more um, on this building and perhaps on some of the other ones. Um, so now I'd like to uh, welcome Ken Torino into the conversation. And Ken is manager of community partnerships and resource development for Historic New England. And he teaches a course on the future of historic houses at Tufts uh, Museum Study Program. And welcome Ken, it's, and thank you for joining us. Thank you, Martha. Um, I'm delighted to be here uh, and to be part of this conversation. Um, and I'm gonna just jump in with my slides because I'm a visual person and I need them. <laughs> um, uh, one of the reasons I was invited here was because Max von Bolgoe and I, um, besides my work teaching, produced this book. And we uh, do a workshop around the country um, for the American Association for State and Local History. Um, looking at the current state of historic sites. Uh, one thing I do want to add to my bio, which I haven't mentioned to Martha and Stephen, uh, is that my first museum job was as a guide at the Essex Institute um, of all the houses that Stephen mentioned. So they're very, very dear to my heart, uh, I have to tell you. So the things I want to talk about and the things that come out in our book are about sustainability, relevancy for our historic sites and community engagement. And Stephen and Martha are absolutely right. It's about the stories that our houses tell and they can tell multiple stories. Next slide, please. And um, for years, just to give you a little idea of what's been going on in the field, everyone has been crying, you know, whoa, that attendance has been going down at historic sites. Well, I'm here to tell you that that shifted um, in the last decade, the newest studies one listed on your board, and you can see the numbers from the American Association for State and Local History, but also the National Park Service studies and um, humanities indicators that show that the trend is up. And why is it up? Is because of, again, many sites are trying to tell new and different stories. And that's what Martha and uh, Stephen are looking at at their sites. We are at Historic New England. Uh, we have 38 historic properties. Our newest one opens next month up in Dresden, Maine. Check out our website for Bowman House. But we're looking to tell these stories that are relevant, that more people can relate to than just the wealthy merchant white story. Next slide, please. This does not come easy uh, and can take years. Many of you have probably visited Monticello for the last 25 years they have been grappling with telling the story of the enslaved. Um, and it's not easy, it takes time. And sometimes organizations don't bother to dig into the stories or ignore some of the stories. Um, in 2018, uh, Monticello opened the display you can see on the bottom uh, right of this slide here. And that's the living quarters of Sally Hemings. Um, that is right below the main house in, and connected by a staircase from the main house. And there they tell the story of this enslaved woman who bore the founding father's four children. So they're telling that story now. And you know what? They're using the words of their son who wrote this story and white historians refuse to listen to. So they're using the words of their son to partially tell this story. More and more sites are trying to ferret out these stories. Next slide, please. And they're looking at ways to enliven their houses. And Stephen mentioned that too. Many people consider this the most exciting historic house in the world. Uh, if you haven't been to it in London, make a reservation next time you're there. When you go in, it's, it's not a pure restoration. It's about the experience in a historic building. And it's about a fictive family, the Jervis family. But when you walk into a room with the fire going, as you see, you will hear voices of people talking and laughing, walking into the next room. You won't see them, but the fire's going. There's real punch in that. In the kitchen, there's food cooking. So you've got the sensory experience, smell. How many historic houses do you go into where the bed is unmade? Our houses are 
usually pristine and not really reflecting light. So this had a profound influence. Next, please. Um, and this is a national trust uh, for uh, National Trust in Britain historic house, Cornwall, um, that I had the pleasure of visiting a few years ago. And it's the unpretentious family home, that's their word, of uh, Thomas Charles. Um, if you go to the next slide, this is very typical of what the National Trust is doing in England to make their houses come alive. And that is the food that you're looking at is all real. So people are experiencing smell as they're going through this house. Next slide, please. They're also getting information in different ways. This is a self-guided tour. But look how where they're putting some of the interpretation on tea towels to talk about the servants, you know, on the pie crust, so you can just get a sense of discovery. Next slide, please. Um, they also have interactives. You see the young man on the right learning how to fold napkins. And then there's like kind of a timeout room, a library where you can pull books off the shelf, sit down, relax, and read. Next slide, please. So where are they getting this? This is coming from the house I showed you, the Dennis Sievers. And let's look at a couple other quick examples. And I want to get some opinions from Martha and Stephen. Um, Lincoln's Cottage, where he spent a quarter of his presidency, um, he was trying to get away from literally the swamp where the White House is, move up to a hill here. Um, this has a guided experience. The, but you, if you look closely at this, I'm, so, I'm sorry it's so small, this, the image on the right, people are actually sitting on the furniture. And the guide involves people in a discussion as they go through. And they have sort of like a magic wand. If you look at the very picture on the bottom, they can have projections on the walls and also on the floor. You also get sound. And that's done in any number of houses, Benjamin Franklin being another example in London. Next slide, please. And here at our Eustace House, um, which until Bowman opens next month was our most recent museum, we use a lot of technology here to tell the stories. Uh, the image on the bottom is actually a kiosk which is scattered throughout the house um, where you can dig down and learn more about each room, you can see the restoration uh, that um, went on in the house. You can see the painting restoration, a little film, interviews, and so on. But you notice we also have a library where you can sit down, pull books off the, sh off the um, shelves. Uh, there's also an iPad you can use. And look, people are sitting on the furniture. So I have a few other slides, but I want to ask Martha and Stephen. What do you think about the use of sort of technology at your historic sites, um, incorporating more of that? Because we've talked mostly low key, guided tours and so on, or self exploratory. Martha, Stephen, jump in. I, I have to it, I have to admit that the um, KPM Museum does not have a technology person, and anytime we have a question or a challenge, we call our friends at PEM and ask them for help, and they're always extraordinarily gracious. So, we are uh, in the beginning stages of introducing technology into our art galleries um, and our um, historic display galleries, but we certainly could try. Um, one thing I can say is that. When we do it, we'll look forward to the visitor using their own gadget and that we will try and stay away from being the ones who have to have the monitor on the wall and service it because for a small organization that can be a challenge. But I can see how a lot of our information would be great um, shared that way, especially in a house where you can't get up the creaky stairs or your knees won't let you get up the creaky stairs. Um, or when material, you need to hear it orally because it's, it's, it's not, there's no visual components. So I think it has great potential. Yeah, and I think from the PEM perspective, introducing media and digital technology into the historic houses is really a logical extension of what we've been doing in the galleries with the new, uh, the new wing that opened in 2019, for example, if you go to the Maritime exhibit or the Asian art exhibit, you can sit in a booth and watch a really compelling short video that'll explain all these layers to a specific object that's in display in a case. And for the historic houses, um, 
I think it would, it, it, the way to tell the story of John Ward at the, at the 17th century house, he was a, 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 a leather, uh, uh, the, the, uh, he was a, a, a court or a, um, a courier, but he uh, was good enough, I guess, at his trade that he was appointed sealer of letter for, leather for the city of Salem, which meant that he um, approved the quality of uh, hide uh, production. But the house was, dendrochronology indicated that the house was added on to in 1692. And uh, the timbers were felled in the winter of 1691. And in the spring, the addition on the house was going up. And it's important to note that the house was exactly across the street from the jail where the accused were held awaiting trial on its original site. And the second floor of it, looking out the windows, you would have been had a clear view of Gallows Hill in the distance. And meanwhile, the Ward family had nothing, there, there's no connection between them and anything that went on historically with the witchcraft hysteria. We know what the dinner table conversations must have been like and what the sounds in the street must have been like. But the fact that the Ward house was, was um, doubled in size in the midst of all that told you that life went on uh, during that, that catastrophe. And I think for the Ward House, there's so much opportunity to explore building forensics and behind the scenes. It's a great link to witchcraft. Uh, you know, they were regular people who witnessed it, even though they weren't involved. Architecture and domestic life. One site that I visited about, oh, maybe three months before the pandemic uh, hit, hit and I was astounded by was St. Mary's City in uh, um, uh, in the Chesapeake in Maryland. It's an entirely reconstructed on archeological footprint 17th century village. None of the buildings are period, but they're all to the extreme level of, uh, you know, academic um, work, traditional crafts and, and archae they're all based on archeology. span There's one house that they, that they reconstructed that was particularly astounding. It was a farmhouse that they've rebuilt. Uh, it's probably about 10 or 15 years old now, but you, you were transported in time to the 17th century. The yard was full of weeds and animals and there were higgledy piggledy fences and there was a fire going and they'd researched children's toys that were scattered on the floor and laundry on a string and vegetables drying. And it was this incredibly immersive experience. I think one of the challenges that we do have in the US regarding historic houses, and it, it, it's, it's not unfounded and it's something to take seriously, but also to think about is the element of fire and lighting. Um, the smell of a fire um, in an old house is, is a compelling thing, especially when most people uh, today don't have that in their homes. If you look at the way a large portion of the population lives in urban areas and things, and um, uh, accredit AAM accreditation and other things, we, we can't, I remember when I was a kid going to the local historic house um, around Halloween, they did a candlelight tour and, and there were, there was cider and a giant cauldron in the smoky fireplace. And it was just the most compelling thing. And, um, we can't do that anymore. We can't really even, we, we shouldn't be burning real candles. We've looked at, you know, close as possible alternatives to that stuff. But these are things that I think we should really be thinking about is the smells, the feels of things, the scratchy fabrics. Many people are adding in music. There are things that you can do and it's about making them more alive and more real to people. Mm -hmm. And I've got a couple other slides. Uh, I know I'm, I'm cautious of time too. And I'm gonna end with those because uh, I put in the chat, the link that will take you to um, all of our web app on Eustace Dot Estate. So everything that's on the kiosk, you can plug in. Martha's already talked about this. Using landscape is something more and more properties are discovering. I know Stephen's limited at the uh, Peabody Essex, um, but you know, working with contemporary art. Next slide, please. And Martha's talked about that. Um, I bring this in because one of the other experiences sites are using, and we do at Eustis, is so people can go on a guided tour if they want, but also 
They can go self-exploration on their own. And that's what you can do at this site of an artist, Thomas Cole in upstate New York. Uh, when you walk in, those screens where the paintings are, um, are empty. And then you sit down and they come alive telling the story of Thomas Cole, but also the Hudson Valley. Next slide, please. And um, they relate to the present by bringing in contemporary um, Hudson River artists. This is uh, Kiki Smith, well-known artist, on their second floor. So Martha, you're already doing things like that. And last slide, and this is a question to you, and I think then we have to let open this to the public. Uh, one of my research areas right now is artisan residence at historic sites. This is one um, that is absolutely amazing. I urge people to check out in Boise. It's owned by the city um, and it's open to the public, but they also have an artist in residence who interacts, teaches classes, creates artwork. Martha, uh, Stephen, uh, what are your thoughts about something like this for your site? Um, I think each one of our buildings has its, as I said before, its challenge. And some of them um, with the contemporary art installations, we found the, the White Ellery House, for instance, lends itself just perfectly to that, so long as the artist doesn't mind the fact there's no light on their artwork or that they have to hang it on a nail that's already there. There's no, you know, no putting new nails in. Um, and in the case of the White Ellery House, it's so old and the, the what's remaining inside, the architectural remnants that are inside are so interesting that they really do inspire artists. And some of the best installations we have had are with those individuals who take the time to experience what the house has to say. And again, it's an empty house, it's just a study house, and then be inspired by that. I we could never have anyone live in there, there's no heating or plumbing, but um, sometimes houses just really speak to creative people and what they come up with is really quite wonderful. And, and it helps a lot of people who, visitors who think, I have no interest in the historic house. I don't wanna go in there, but I like art. And then all of a sudden they realize that, wow, I guess I like this old house too. So I think it's, it's a good thing. Great. That's great. Now, Lauren, could you pull up my final slide so I can just kind of uh, chime in with what Ken and, um, uh, uh, and Martha were saying about uh, use of exterior space and, and so on. Well, we're getting there. There we go. <laughs> right there. Thank you. So, and I think this was 2017 or so, uh, PEM had a, a Scottish artist come over and do these fabulous hand-woven stick cairns that were this, and as they, uh, at, about the year or so that they were up and running as an exhibit that people could walk around and look in and, touch and that sort of thing they they took on an organic life of their own where they sort of shifted in shape and you can see them sort of leaning toward and away from one another and this is one way that we've used the the landscapes around the historic houses for something other than just open space or gardening mm -hmm. and also um i don't have a slide of, of this but before my time at pem the gardner pingree house which we saw a moment ago uh, there was we have done modern art installations in that building where the 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 historic decorative arts are taken out and uh, an exhibition of something else exciting has gone in. I think you know one opportunity that, that we may have at PEM is that point of an artist in in residence who would work for a semester or a term because with some of our historic houses in the past there were probably I'm trying to think now one two, three or four of them or so that had uh, caretakers apartments in them that then in some instances were actually lived in by staff and then that mm -hmm. program was ended, but we still have some residential space and we even have one mansion, the, the, um, the Cotting Smith Assembly House that could support something like that where an artist could live in a historic house be within a, a stone's throw of everything that the museum in Salem has to offer and kind of, you know, it's sort of the way uh, I could envision something along the lines of uh, when you commission a, a, a violin maker to make you a, a violin, that's a months long process of choosing the wood and working with the builder and 
and all the way up through the final touches when it when it comes into your hands. And that might be a really interesting way to look at art and instead of someone just bringing in a pre-finished piece that they've made right. to actually be engaged the whole creative process on site. Yeah, <laughs> the, the, there's so much to go uh, to choose from now. It's an exciting time for historic houses. And I'm sorry I've gone over because I think we need to bring Blair back in. <laughs> yeah, I think um, I, yes, I'd like to invite Blair to um, to invite guests to participate in our conversation. Well, thank you all. I'm Blair Steck. I'm with the Peabody Essex Museum. I'm the director of um, uh, inclusive philanthropy. And, um, you know, I just love hearing about historic structures and the stories within. So thank you three very much for taking us on this journey. Um, we have a few questions. And so I'm going to do my best to um, uh, get through these questions and, and get some answers for our um, attendees here. I'll go on one that I, I think can be answered quickly. Um, and this is from Patricia, who says, I have heard several preservation architects and historians say that the term first period is not currently used because it is Eurocentric and that <sighs> such structures would be referred to as of the 17th century. Which te terminology is commonly accepted? So I'm gonna jump in real quick because uh, as Patricia knows, I wear another hat and that is to the vice president to Patricia at the House of Seven Gables. And yes, uh, Patricia, that is um, no longer commonly used uh, because whose first period? Certainly not Native Americans first period. Um, and we at Historic New England have purged that language from our website. Um, and um, I know the Gables has done a purge too. And going with 17th century or early 18th century. So that is the direction the field is going in. Great. Thank you. Um, here is a question from Katie. Are there issues for or with the issues of touching objects sitting on furniture, um, does that mean one needs to introduce more accurate reproductions for that and then store away the originals? How, how do you manage that? You want? <laughs> well, I'll say we don't, we use purely modern folding chairs or something like that. So we haven't, we haven't gone down the road of having reproductions. Uh, that mm -hmm. might confuse people, um, but I think it's important to not confuse them so that you're not the police person ruining a tour by scolding somebody because I didn't realize. Yes. Mm -hmm. Right. I, I can tell you that, uh, for example, at the President Lincoln's cottage, they bought all period material because you can still get the Victorian furniture. And that's what we did at the Eustace, Eustace estate. So we're not using collections items. Um, actually buying the period Victorian was cheaper than having reproductions <laughs> made. Uh, that might not be so of a wonderful uh, Salem 18th century McIntyre piece, but um, you know, these aren't, what we were talking about, all three of us, is not right for every single house. Every house is different, has different stories. So you really have to consider what's the most appropriate use to tell the story at that house. This is just one in Stephen and Martha's grab bag to whatever fits this new property that you're working on, Martha, is what you'll do. But I yes, there are territorial concerns. <laughs> I also think that it's an, a real opportunity for collections departments uh, to be thinking along these lines. Because when I think of all the museums that I've worked in or consulted with before you know, PEM, there are these, most museums have troves of period furnishings that don't meet the standards for our gallery exhibition. That it, it you know, deaccessioning objects is, is another story, but oftentimes I'm thinking of a museum that I worked with extensively up in Maine, you know, all this furniture from the 18th century and early 19th century that has a local provenance, is by a known maker, but was refinished in the 1940s or isn't the best example. And we've always wondered, what do we do with these things that 
you know, are we going to just forever be caretakers of something that sits in archival storage? And maybe this is a great opportunity to rethink how those pieces are deployed. Because I think every museum has them. Right. We could do a whole panel on that. Uh, <laughs> right. <laughs> we could absolutely get into that. Yes. All right. Um, this question is specifically for Stephen. For Ward House, how would a future restoration or interpretation be different from the current colonial revival era restoration? Well, all of the forensic study that we did of the building indicated that it was the the, for the fenestration pattern or the the, or the size and the arrangement of the windows, for example, was very different uh, in the 17th century. And in the colonial revival period, they plugged casement leaded glass casement windows into 1770s Georgian openings from when the house had been renovated in the 1700s. Also in that time, the interior, uh, you know, many people like George Francis Dow and, and others had taken their trips to England and seen all of the half timbered structures from the Middle Ages and the Renaissance and came home. And so they, they when they saw all these beams and posts and corbels and carvings, they, the, the instinct was to take all the paint off and reveal that old wood and give you that sense of ancientness. Mm -hmm. And what we really know about the ward house is the interior of it was very bright at that mm -hmm. time. It was whitewashes and, and pigmented paints and a lot more plaster and a lot less wainscot than you see right now. And so you'd see an interior it with if with the John Ward House restored to what we know it was more like, it would be a much brighter interior, and it would also be something that would would take advantage of prevailing daylight. Um, the house now faces east, but when it was on its original foundation, it faced south, which was very common to take advantage of the way the sun moved, the size of the windows. Um, and also the, the lightness of the walls in contrast to the darkness of the furnishings. And I don't mean darkness as in dark wood, but sometimes painted black or painted reds or greens. These are things that showed up against the white plaster in the night when people had to navigate the house mm -hmm. with, with, mm -hmm. with not a lot of light. And there was a lot more contrast, but there isn't a lot of contrast between the old wooden chair and the old wooden beams in the mm -hmm. house right now, but in the 17th century, those things might have been quite different. And mm -hmm. so I think you could really offer uh, a, just a, 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 an experience. The, the, the colonial revival experience really does give you a taste of it. You're seeing real objects, you're in a real building, but I think there's so much more that can be done there to bring out the, the you know, um, an experience that you could say, well, this is really the type of room that somebody was sitting in in 1692. Yeah. And we found the same thing in the White Ellery House, that there was plaster removal during the initial restorations in the 1940s, um, that, uh, you know, especially um, stripping of fireplace walls and awful. And that, that makes it quite remarkable that it, some of the decorative painting that still survives in the kitchen area on the ceiling and the walls was somehow salvaged. So you can see that, um, that things like that were done in the 1700s. So. Absolutely, thank you. Well, given the time, I think I'll grab one more question that's actually um, similarly, similarly posed by um, two guests. <laughs> Um, and, and so that everyone knows, um, uh, we do provide these questions to our panelists afterwards. So hopefully we can get them answered for you at some point, if not right now. Um, this is uh, from an anonymous viewer. I know Plymouth Plantation has done indigenous First Nations people's shelters houses. I wonder if Cam or Pem would think about doing something to point to that pre 1623 17th century history north of Boston? I, th I think that we need to. And um, as we look into the history of our newest property, the Babson Alling House, which is on its original foundation at what was the town green, we're pretty sure that the first English settlers followed the pattern of the people who were here before them. Um, it, was a, it, it was a site that was close to uh, freshwater 
to uh, a river, to salt hay, to the forest. And um, so we do need to figure that into our story because it didn't just start in 1740 and we would be horribly wrong and inaccurate to assume that. Um, and we have some traces of information, not a lot that give us uh, clues as to what um, earlier settlement patterns and, and houses or whatever might have looked. So it's up to us to, to do the digging and to find some answers. I think that's, I think that, you know, one of the things about that that's really important to think about is we don't have, unlike Plymouth Plantation, which does, you know, reconstructed structures, we don't have um, a physical plant that would be a building that dates to pre-settlement. And surprisingly, um, Salem is a really undiscovered, largely undiscovered archaeological treasure trove. Um, and I think that, you know, between objects and collections, I think reaching out to indigenous tribes who trace their ancestry back and involving them would be fabulous. And I also think that really as a, as a community, we should be thinking very seriously about archaeology uh, in the area in regards to climate change because so much of Native American activity took, close, took place very close to water and sea levels are rising. And you, know, you see all over the place, I, I'm just reading articles about things happening in Alexandria, Virginia, where the hull of a 1775 ship is exposed that wasn't visible before because of erosion. And mm -hmm. you know, I think we can, this is a really important opportunity for us to be looking into um, uh, representing pre-European cultures, but also involving the, the cultures that those people are from that um, are part of us today as well. Right. And if we don't find the evidence here at Cape Museum Green, then it's, it's incumbent on us to look to Salem for what evidence you might have, to Portsmouth, New Hampshire, to other communities which are comparable to our own. And right. You you two may know better, but um, I know that Pioneer Village in Salem is reinventing themselves and they're yes. moving. Um, and I believe there might be some talk about doing this there. Uh, but I don't know for don't quote me on that. Stay tuned. <laughs> yeah, that I can. I I heard a lot about that project before the fall, before COVID and into the winter. Um, they were going to move it around to. Um, uh, there, the, there was the, the plan was to to float by barge all of those existing buildings that were designed by George Francis Dow around to the other side of that uh, promontory area near Horseheads Beach, um, and yeah, there were there was talk about it, in introducing a much stronger Native American component to the village and redesigning the way the buildings relate to each other. Uh, I, I wish I could report more, but I haven't heard a peep in months. Mm. Well, I have to say, I'm sorry to close this out because I think it is so interesting to keep talking about all these. And, and you know, Stephen, Ken, and Martha, I think you talked about the connection, not only through history, but with each other um, and, and our overlap and, um, uh, sharing our experiences with each other and how fortunate we are to have that connection. So thank you very, very much. I'd like to thank Bob and Oliver for um, being our leaders and hosts tonight as well. And um, I just want to thank everyone who has come tonight uh, to partake in this um, really excellent panel. Thank you very, very much. Well, thank you all. Good, good, good night. <laughs>